All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for being a part of this conversation and for coming back for a second day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, once again, this is Anderson Du Bois, and here with me today, we have a REAP yes. staff person that's going to co host alongside of me. Would you like to introduce yourself? I would. Thank you, Anderson. Hello, everyone. My name is Esther Hardy, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a, a list of folks that we would like to thank for being a part of the conversation. If you'd like to uh, thank some of those folks. Absolutely. So we want to take this time just to appreciate, um, first of all, the media. Thank you so much. We want to also appreciate all education staff, K through 12. We also want to thank our Oregon School Board Association. Uh, we also would like to thank Confederation of School Administrators, the Oregon Department of Education, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, and the Oregon Education Association, the Teachers Union. Thank you so much for participating and supporting this discussion. And thank you to um, everyone who's a part of this call, students included. It's um, something very special. So we're thankful for your joining us here today. Thank you so much for all the students that came in yesterday and shared uh, their, their stories, their personal stories and what they experienced in the education system as a, a student of color, um, experiencing uh, the, the, the various different systems of oppression within the system of school. And so with that, some of the points that we hit, um, some students spoke on disproportionate discipline within the schools uh, where uh, some students would get punished with one thing and another student would not, uh, especially in the case of using the uh, N-word where other students would use the word and when they spoke out against that, they would be the ones that uh, got in trouble. Uh, we saw uh, not, not supportive or trained teachers in the conversations to deal with those situations. Student, uh, teachers just uh, putting their hands up and saying, I, 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 I'm gonna forward you to somebody else or leaving the students to, to fend for themselves. And students uh, stating that that behavior, those responses have become normalized. They're used to fending for themselves uh, for, uh, in, in situations like that. Uh, we, we heard from students who experienced uh, being in a hostile racial environment uh, where they had to focus on all these different micro and macro aggressions in the schools and yet still try to uh, maintain a sense of sanity and try and get good grades and behave um, as a good student should. Um, and uh, other things that we, we saw uh, as staff in the schools is uh, challenges with getting programming uh, going in terms of uh, trying to get uh, Black History Month assemblies. Uh, some saying that, no, we're not doing uh, a Black History Month assembly. We're just going to do a multicultural one, um, or we're not going to do one at all. That's we're just going to do a, a general spirit assembly. Um, challenges with getting up black student unions and having advisors uh, in the schools to support the students uh, with their voices, with different programming that they'd like to do. Um, and lastly, uh, students uh, were asking for mandated ethnic studies classes that. Uh, not all schools have Black studies, Black history in the schools. And in some cases, just with the regular, uh, the, the traditional curriculum that is in some of the schools, uh, they, they stated that they, students had to go online to YouTube to learn their own history because the teachers did not go as far in depth as they could have. And so uh, uh, found themselves uncomfortable in the classes because others turned to them and teachers were not always comfortable even sharing that information out um, with some of the feedback that we got from, from our last meeting. And as you guys know, today, today is focused on solutions to some of those issues that have been brought up. Um, I mean, let's call it what it is. It's, it's systemic uh, racial oppression that has been in uh, some of these school systems uh, offering barriers towards change for students uh, for different organizations. And uh, I believe today we're all here to uh, talk about that, come up with solutions and listen to what the youth have to say on that. Um, 
So as, as we get started, um, I framing all of that in with all of that in mind, uh, my first question is uh, how, if we did not do anything forward, like after this meeting, students, how would you feel going back to school with all those things on the table um, after COVID has come out, we've seen the, the, the um, disproportionate inequities uh, in schools, but as well, the conversation around the racial inequities and the education systems. If nothing got solved, how would you feel going back to school in the fall? If any students would like to take that on. Hello, my name is Edmund. I am a, going to be 11th grade. I'm from hey, Aloha High School. Okay. Um, if, I, if nothing's been done and I'm, I'm going to be going back to school in the fall and everything's all the same, I would feel like disappointed that, and I'll, yeah, I'll just feel really disappointed if nothing's being done. Mm. Mm. Disappointed. I mean, that's, that is, I think, really hard. I think after seeing so much going on in the nation and having such huge opportunity for change um, that we would not want to disappoint you going back to school to go to the same situation that you came out of um, now that these things have been uncovered. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you. Would any other uh, students like to respond to that? I think kind of echoing with what Edmond said um, is that like going back and nothing has been done, it also feels kind of like even more isolating, I think for um, communities affected because and it's like the issues have been brought up to light. It's been in the news, it's been in the media, it's like been everywhere and still it wasn't addressed. And it's like how much further do people have to go for it to be recognized as an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Did anybody else wanna share? I know there are more students out there. This is, this is our moment. Mm -hmm. There are so many um, voices of influence uh, on this call right now and uh, the state is listening. I, I don't know if you guys were aware, but last night you guys were on uh, Channel 12. Uh, you guys made the news, your voices, uh, the experiences that you guys are uh, sharing out. You guys are, are in, a, in a position of change right now. And so I uh, definitely want to hear from you guys. Is there any other students that would like to respond? Can you repeat the question because I just joined the call? Yes, yes. Uh, yesterday you guys talked about the different things that you guys are experiencing uh, in the school systems, disproportionate uh, discipline, uh, not getting supported by teachers and uh, having teachers working to try and train, uh, do classes with history and not feeling comfortable, you know, even giving that information out all the time. Um, the N-word being normalized in the schools, um, not always having the ability to have Black History Month assemblies or supported Black student unions. Um, you guys spoke towards there being uh, not mandated ethnic studies classes. And so I was asking the question is that like, if none of, if nothing got changed, now knowing all those things are existence in the existence uh, of, in your schools, how would you feel going back to school in the fall, like knowing that you had to go back to that, how, what would your, your, your response be? Um, me personally, I would feel like my voice wasn't heard because we're going to these meetings, we're attending meetings like this and there's rioting out and there's like peaceful protests as well. And I would feel like there like it'd be for nothing if you don't visually like if you don't actually see a change in your and like your everyday life when you go out of quarantine back to school i would agree with shade uh i'm first in centennial high school and from my school's end it would just be neglect with everything going on 
right now, it would I would just see it as neglect for them to not really acknowledge us after seeing what's going on. And I know my school has a lot of issues like this, and we've dealt with a lot of we've addressed a lot of these issues this year. For them to not learn from that this fall, this coming fall, I don't I wouldn't be comfortable as a student. But I think that a lot of the things that happened this year before the rioting and before the protests and us students using our voices to really, because we're like black students at Spindale, you know, we're a small minority. We're just, so us voicing our issues there, you know, we felt like we were hurt in a way. And really what's going on like across the nation really just showed how much of an issue this is. And it's smaller, it's bigger than um what we are just going through. So if they didn't address this, they didn't address this more and if they didn't, you know, take more action in, you know, we, I would feel like they really just they're neglecting those students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, honestly, neglect is, is a, uh, one of the, um, points of psychological warfare. I mean, it, it mm -hmm. bullying in regard. Um, and so that's, that does not make for a, a, a great learning environment for students going back to school. Um, so I, I think that really just reinforces the, the point that this is something we need to get on, uh, that we need to respond to um, and, and appropriately. Um, would, you, would you like to ask the next question? Yeah. Thank you to the students who have shared so far. I uh, appreciate your honesty and your vulnerability. Um, so again, the focus of today's conversation is solution oriented, um, and we have begun to review a lot of the issues, a lot of the problems that surfaced in our conversation yesterday. Um, I'm curious to begin and uh, open up this discussion of what solutions may look like. Um, so maybe returning to one of our themes from yesterday, which was disproportionate discipline um, to our students who are on the call. Um, who maybe have personally experienced this in schools or have seen friends or family in school experience this, um, what do you think could be uh, a way that you would feel supported? Where does the solution begin? What would you like to see start to happen? Uh, for me, what I would like to see happen with like coming discipline to those students who say racial slurs or do racist things, uh, I would like those students to like be put in class that educates them on oppression, racism, and why they shouldn't do those kind of things. And I would also like their family to also be involved in their learning because like sometimes it's, it could start in the home or their, mm -hmm. their family could also be like having issues with that. So I think it's also important to get the family involved so that they can all work together to to get more understanding of it and to also like to also teach other possibly other younger siblings or older siblings or their parents to like why those things are why they shouldn't do thank you that's an excellent answer. Would any other students care to um, share their response to that question as well, their ideas about a solution? I'd even like to bring back to the memory of like, uh, the discussion around uh, how the N-word would be used, mm -hmm. you know, or fighting or even just, uh, I heard students saying yesterday that there were uh, times where they got in trouble just for expressing, you know, dissatisfaction in the class, being fatigued or just mm -hmm. being upset. And for reasons like that, they'd be sent out of the classroom, uh, missing you know, hours of class time. Mm -hmm. um, what are potential solutions to that? Like, how would you like to be treated instead or responded to instead? Um, I feel like um, if we, if because everybody gets um, upset sometimes, so 
it, it depends on like how you react. Like I feel like if it depends on what we're reacting to for one, but like if we're just upset and the teacher can see that we're upset, we shouldn't get like sent out of the classroom for no re for just being upset because everybody has their off days, their bad days. The teacher shouldn't just like send us out of the classroom because we're losing our education time. We're losing time that we could be learning. Instead, we're getting sent out of the classroom because they feel like, oh, we're going to disrupt at one point because we're upset. We show that we can control it without getting like so, you know, like. I feel like that's where they kind of expect that we're going to go, that we're just going to ruin everybody else's time of learning because we're upset and they can see that we're a little upset. That's not, I don't know, it's not tough. Yeah. I, I remember actually uh, my first year working for Reap, uh, and I, I went into a music teacher's classroom and uh, I noticed that the classroom itself was empty, but there was an entire group of students standing outside the door almost every single day. And I was wondering, you know, what's going on here? Um, and the teacher's solution was to kick out students that were being um, disruptive to the learning environment. But by the end of the day, like every student was pretty much outside of the class. There's only like two students left in the classroom sometimes. And uh, when talking to the students, the students felt that the teacher just did not care about the students. And so, yeah, I can definitely see some training, some conversations that need to be had around issues like that. I also feel like, oh, oh sorry. I feel like it's mandatory for also teachers to reflect on how they treat each and every student from the self, like individually to like, and then reflect on, okay, putting category as to why they might treat certain students, like point out certain students or might think that certain students have an attitude and they're being disrespectful. Because, like, I'm not sure if they do it on purpose, but let's say they did do it on purpose. It could be just, like, subconscious discrimination, which I think, like, teachers themselves need to realize and need to also like take the time out of their day to reflect on how they're treating each of their students and also knowing how to deal with racism or like other issue within their classroom. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Was there someone else who was beginning a thought? Um, well, I was gonna just say how like we don't like most like we're not like allowed to be upset like okay. whenever we don't we don't we're not allowed to have off days it's just like if we mm -hmm. know that we're upset it's it's the way that we're reacted to we're not reacting to the way that other students would be reacted to it's just like oh they act like it's repeated behavior most of the time it's not it's just like we're not allowed to have off days and the way they react to us is just so negatively and you know and if we react back negatively, you know, we just get it even worse. It's like, we're not allowed to be upset one day. It's just, we're treated way differently than any other students. It's really, it just makes you not want to be in that environment. And it's not fair to us. So, you know, we're, we have the right to be there. It's just like, we just can't have any off days or we just can't, you know, express ourselves any other way other than just the way that they want to see us. And that's not right. And, and, and that right there, you know, not having any off days, that's exhausting. Mm -hmm. That's exhausting. And I know, you know, at the same time, schools are pushing for state testing measurements and outcomes and making sure that folks are doing well with their grades, um, but are, you know, uh, and that's, that's a question to follow up on. How much or what are you seeing being done in the schools? to mitigate or lessen that exhaustion for you guys? Um, I uh, have something to say about this subject. <clears throat> I feel like uh, instead of like just kicking you out of the class and just completely push you away like a problem or that the, the person has a problem and just completely push you away and be like, okay, go to the office, you'll calm down eventually. I feel like maybe you should take them outside 
and have a conversation and be like, okay, what's wrong? How can I make this better? How can we go back inside the classroom and be calm and content or be, um, or not have these emotions anymore that cause irritation toward you, to you. Um, I feel like that would be a better conversation than just completely kicking them out of the class and just being like, okay, it's up to you to make yourself calm, which it is, but I feel like if you were, if they were to help you get to that point, it would be much easier, much quicker than just, you know, sending them out. It might take it just hours and hours of them just, you know, it'll probably get them more irritated at something. So I feel like if they deal with the problem right then and there, it's better. Mm. Do you do you feel like like your teachers are trained on like well on how to de-escalate issues like that? Do you feel like uh, they? Yes, my te- you know I mean uh, the teachers I have now. Yes, they do actually deal with them. But I'm talking for the teachers that don't like, uh, and this ties into the fact uh, that her school, you know, how, you know, they just send me okay the read. Area will just send you there, they know how to take care of you and take care of this type of people. Like, I feel like, you know, it ties into the fact that if you're a teacher, you need to learn and you need to know how to take care of all students of all, mm-hmm. you know, races and ethnicities. Yes. You can't just, you know, and I feel know, like the students should know be, how to take care of them. Huh? I feel like the students should need to be treated differently based off their ethnicity. They should be looked out as. Someone who's there to learn, someone who's there to be educated, yeah. not looked at as like, oh, this student's gonna be more difficult. Like, I gotta keep an eye on them because of their ethnicity. Like, oh, they're a little upset. Um, you know, to never be like that. Just you should look at all your students equally. So. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, mm-hmm. And to the other students listening as well, we can we can hear from more students. Uh, other students, uh, what what solutions might we be able to uh, suggest or propose to our education administrators uh, under disproportionate discipline? I, I see other folks on the call. Uh, what what suggestions could we do to do differently? Uh, some students said, you know, rather than going from zero to one hundred, just sending students out to class. Maybe there's progression that needs to be followed. Um, are there are there any other solutions that students might um, prefer being uh, followed up with in cases like that? Can I? Okay, so I've been thinking about a solution, and I think it should not be up to the teachers entirely to deal with mental illness or not mental illness, but just like mental health problems. Because you know, part of life is having bad days, but their job is just to teach people. They should be able to deal with problems to an extent. But I feel like um, there should be like a whole different organization within the schools to help deal with mental health, kind of like mm. counselors, but counselors, not school counselors that we have them today because their job is to like manage the school or whatever. We have counselors for mental health, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, uh, would you, so would you suggest that every school has a proportionate number of uh, counselors to students, not like one to one, but like make sure every student has a uh, quick access to counselors or organization partnered with the schools for that. Is that yeah, what you should? Gotcha. It should be like if a kid is having a bad day and a teacher notices, they just write them a pass and say, "I see you're having a bad day." You know, privately, maybe you should go talk to someone. Hmm. Wow, that would be big. Um, because mm-hmm. I know uh, they're they're. I mean, right now, there are not enough counselors per student, and just mental health is a huge issue for the state right now. Huge issue for the state. Mm-hmm. Um, I see the chat lighting up with responses to, to what you're saying. Thank you for sharing. Mm-hmm. Is there uh, anyone wanting to speak more on disproportionate uh, discipline before we start uh, talking about the um, uh, support or uh, lack thereof for teachers 
um, and the need for trained teachers in various conversations? I do. Uh, what you what you should do is that if you're like you're really like feeling bad and you're really upset and you're in a bad mood, the teacher notices. And you should ask them to give you some personal space until you can like cool down and get and do back what the teacher's telling you to do. Mm. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Holden. You're welcome. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective, Holden. Do you feel currently as a student that you have that type of empowerment or that space to be able to speak up for yourself in the classroom or do you think that that's currently an issue like sometimes i get angry in class so i uh, ask the teacher for some personal space or a break so i can just cool down and uh go and then when i'm like cool i can uh do what the teacher says again and i'm not angry Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Uh -huh. um, I know, I know being REAP in a lot of the different schools, I'm curious about space literally as a physical um, uh, area in the school outside of the classroom. You know, is there space for each of you guys to go um, that uh, isn't taken by another organization or another? Uh, is, there, is there enough space for you guys to be able to de-exhaust? from all these things. Um, I, oh, wait, never mind. I just wanted to say about the discipline thing that um, it should be different based off like elementary school, middle school and high school because like people, they should be dealt with differently because like elementary school kids are gonna be different than a high school kid would be on a bad day you know what i'm saying so i feel like the discipline should be different with that mm -hmm. one because just the age difference you shouldn't be treated like a kindergartner if you're about to be 18 you know so mm -hmm. as far as that i think that mm -hmm. thank you for sharing yeah. Was there another student that was going to speak at the same time? Yeah, that was me. Um, what? There was a, some space for you to cool down. It, you would just have to ask your teacher to go there, and then you and then you cool down. Like, like you uh, sit there until you're like uh, cool enough not get angry to throw a tantrum and. and You'll have to go to the principal's office. Thank you for sharing. Um, I love the view with Cameron in most school. Well, I don't know. I can't speak for every school, but for like my school, we have brief, and that's really the only space for us to really. Mm -hmm. If there, it's like it's like mm -hmm. teachers use that as if they can't really deal with the minority student. They just send us to the reef room because that's where we have most of our like you know leaders like they can't deal with us so they send people that look like us and deal with us in most cases it works mm -hmm. but you know you you're a teacher you know you're supposed to deal with uh, all your students and it's like they just use that as like you know like they just use it as a way to, you know not to deal with us you know you go to the reef room if you need to cool down or something like because they know that those people know how to deal with us you know how to get us you know, level-headed, but they can't really be bothered to deal with our issues. It's mostly, like, they use the reef room. Mm -hmm. I get irritated by that sometimes, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go please ahead. continue. Um, I, so I went to Centennial, and I personally, I got irritated by it because I was like, why do you... I'll, I'll, I mean, I had no problem going to the reef room, but it's just like, why every time... I'm like irritated or something like that. You have to send me. Like I don't know. I just got irritated sometimes. Well, I think thank you for sharing that. I think an interesting point was just surfaced, which is that there's this idea of sending students of color to a place where there are people that look like them, because and I keep hearing they like the teachers feel like they can't deal with that student, 
do you think that that is a part of the issue um, for our students on this call that maybe there's not as much representation across the faculty or the students, excuse me, not the students, but the teachers, um, that that could contribute to this us versus them mentality and I don't know how to deal with these students on this send them out? Yes, Mia. I think definitely one of the issues. Yeah, I personally really like enjoy the reef room. Like that's well, the sunroom and the reef is in there. I I personally enjoy it, but my brother he goes to like a rental school district, so he doesn't get to have like that experience because there's not a reef there. Oh, um, the teachers do this a little differently. They don't really do they um. They do what I was talking about, which is I think is probably good for every kid. Um, they just like if they see you're irritated or if something's going wrong with you with another student, they'll take both of them outside for like maybe the longest has been like two minutes of class time or a break time, like when everybody's doing work, so he can actually he or she can take us out of the class and like talk to us about how we can work out the problem. Yeah, but sometimes teachers don't always have that opportunity because they're like they have a full schedule of what they have to teach you. Like Yeah, mm -hmm. but but that's what I'm saying because um my uh, the teacher at my school, I don't know if your teachers are this, but the teacher at my school they tell us about it, like teach us about it, and then they give us like usually a quiz or something about a test. And that's like the classroom. break time. So like that time will be like the best for them to, you know, work out any kind of problem in class uh, while the rest of the class is working. Yeah, I I noticed that like people are more successful in like the alternative schools because there's more one on one. Like the the classes are smaller. Like I think that's a really good thing to have like a smaller classrooms too. That's Absolutely. like not. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, one, emphasize what you're saying is that the need for smaller classrooms uh, increases the chances and the ability to have better relationships with the teachers, but as well as a REAP staff person doing our, our reflections program in the schools, uh, you were saying to have the opportunity to work out uh, issues with teachers one-on-one -on -one after a situation. Uh, I know a lot of that goes around restorative practices and being able to sit down with the teacher and talk about what the issue is in the classroom and come up with some solutions. Um, I know as a staff person trying to do that with students and bringing students and teachers together, sometimes there's barriers there because of um, contracting issues. Um, there's so much time in the day, as you were saying, that a teacher can spend towards uh, any one conversation. So that can be uh, really difficult because they're busy trying to prep their next classes and set up the class. And sometimes having those conversations aren't able to be priority when uh, we know that sometimes one day feeds into the next, one period feeds into the next. And that can be a huge issue. Um, if teachers had more time for their students just within their schedules, that would be amazing, amazing. Uh, is it okay if I speak? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, my name is Joshua. Uh, I go to Clackamas High School. Um, one thing that I was thinking about is I don't really see any Black representatives. I mean, when I say representatives, I mean like counselors, teachers, just anyone. And I was thinking like schools should have resources. Like if, like if a student of color or just a student of any ethnicity should have resources saying like, I'm this color, can I, can I please get a counselor that is the same ethnicity as me? Like they should have resources like slips of paper or something you can grab, numbers you can call, even if the school mm. can't pay for it, like they should still have those resources out so people know about it. Mm. Yeah, I know, I know David Douglas district was in the middle of trying to get uh, a, a teachers of color resource list set up to peer out, uh, do peer mentorship with students, but I don't know if that's a practice every school district is engaging in as well. Um, you know, some, some, some folks are, are blessed with, you know, uh, administration that look like them and some are not. And sadly, it's, it's, not, it's not common enough. It's not common enough. So it sounds like the solution is to hire more counselors 
of color, as well yeah. as more teachers of color, as well as be able to select administration or uh, counselors that look like yourself? Mm-hmm. Yes. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Also, um, like, sorry, <laughs> um, like, let's say like Black History Month. When when Black History Month when Black History Month occurs, nobody really talks about it. Like I remember eighth, ninth, eighth, and some of ninth grade, I didn't realize that Black History Month was here, like in February, because nobody really talked about it. So I was also thinking, like maybe they could have professionals come in, like that have majors on that and teach about it. Like during the Holocaust, they bring in somebody who knows about the Holocaust to come talk about it. Black History Month, they bring in somebody who is specialized on like history month and like they bring in artifacts and stuff that we can see and maybe even touch mm. and that goes mm. with any unit not just black specifically yes black history month but with any unit as well yeah there are there are floating or moving um black history museums that schools can um hire in and they can travel from school to school and bring in different artifacts as well i mean there's local black artists that can come in and do activities with schools, with teachers. Um, and I think it's one of those things that we would we would need to allocate a budget for that, you know, as well as, you know, to support organizations like REAP to be able to uh, connect that much more thoroughly with the schools. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Uh, let's talk about that. You, you, you hit that point on having um, Black history programming. Um, what what other solutions towards having um, Black History programming when it comes to Black History Month? Um, have folks experienced you know difficulty uh, running their own Black History Month assemblies or events? And then like what solutions do you think you would have um, to be able to make those go more smoother um, and with more youth voice? Mm, I remember last year the seniors tried to like organize a Black History Month assembly, but then like the principal was like, we'll just like include that in like the culture assembly. And he didn't really address Black Black History Month in the cultural assembly. So I feel like it's also important to have Black, Black Black History Month like as an assembly for itself, because like it gets overshadowed when everyone's trying to celebrate other cultures and all the different types of cultures and I also think like how it's important for um to have a unit for black studies in um in schools because like a lot of when in we like in history class they don't go over things like the slave trade or slavery or even how 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 Africans were before they they were captured and enslaved. And so like their history beha- before slavery was hidden and was overshadowed, it's like never brought up. It's like their history starts with slavery. And I also think it's like important to include education, engineer, black engineers and how the everyday, everyday things is created by black people because like even in school when they're talking about like famous engineers and stuff they don't include black people and when it's like the iron board was made by a black woman named Sarah Bonet like I never knew that until I did my own research and that how the security system was co-invented by a black person like there's so many things invented by black people that they just ignored. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so it, and it sounds like there's a lot of burden on the student to do their own research, to fill in the gaps for themselves. And I see somebody uh, in the chat who is saying, uh, you know, even, even uh, uh, BIPOC community teachers and counselors should go through equity, anti-racism, PD training uh, with uh, white colleagues for a better understanding, team building for holistic support for our students. Um, yeah. Uh, training is needed so that uh, that we can have better programming for you guys, for our, for our students. Um, and, and that's why it's great to have organizations like REAP in the schools to sort of advocate in. I know over at Centennial High School, at uh, Beaverton High School, 
and a few other schools. Uh, there have been opportunities where, where and David Douglas, where Reef staff have helped to create and plan and make sure it's on the calendars for different schools to make sure that those assemblies do happen. And you guys have uh, that front and center um, ability to, to engage. Um, did anybody else want to talk about uh, the Black History uh, assemblies and programming? Do we want to move to ethnic studies classes? Should those be mandatory? Um, what do you guys think about that? What do you guys, what solutions do you have around, around that? Um, what I think they should have around it is that they should have like more respect for black people because like let your uh, let's say you you're in a class with a, a white person and they make fun of you and and you don't like that uh, and it's not fair to the black person who's being made fun of so they should say like no say, saying mean words or stop being a bully to the, the to the black people so they have like so it's fair so they don't be treated uh, to be treated wrong mm. it, it, it sounds like you guys you know these classrooms these conversations are practice for you guys to have these conversations in the real world you know and so i guess it's a good question of like do you guys feel that your <laughs> teachers your schools prepare you to have conversations like these? Um, and if not, um, what what could be done better um, potentially in ethnic studies classes for that? I, uh, oops. Go ahead. Um, I feel that we should um, talk about like actual like black like history and stuff because we only talk about like the stuff like like, I don't know how to explain it. It's, like, not important stuff. Like, they talk about, like, the bad stuff with, like, like, I, I don't know how to explain it. I just had it in my head and it just went away. It, it sounds like you're saying you, it should be balanced out. It shouldn't just be, you know, uh, how the Black community has negatively affected America or uh, the rest of America or how America has negatively affected the black community, but show the accomplishments on both sides. It sounds like something along the lines of yeah, what you're saying. Exactly oh. what I mean. Gotcha. Yeah. Gosh, gosh. I think extending on to that, like in school when they bring a slave, they always look at the black person and it's just almost like how if slavery was abolished, people just assume like that black people would still be a slave, but that's just to show how, like, that they were just a slave person instead of an actual person that could do, like, many things. They don't really elaborate on the great things that black people can do. Mm. I agree with Edelman and um, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. And sometimes when I put my phone down, you guys can't. Um, you can. But I agree with them, and I think, like, as far as, like, when it comes to just normal U.S. history and stuff, they, they give us projects to engage in, in just learning. I feel like they don't do that so much on Black History Month or just even learning about Black history. We don't do so many projects or actually get into depth with things to get students engaged. That's why it's not a comfortable conversation to have. Like people are feeling uncomfortable. And then on top of that, we don't do any engaging projects to get in with the class and learn more and to interact with the class. It's just a brief, brief one unit and there's no like actual engaging. We're not actually learning. We're not, we might be writing something down that's on the board just on our paper but we're actively learning we're not we're not actively doing projects that we have to go do research and learn on i would agree with shade um the only time i would agree with everybody i would the only time i remember ever being in a classroom feeling comfortable and feeling like i'm actually learning about stuff that we 
you know, about Black history because it didn't start, our history didn't start with just slavery. I've only felt engaged and I've only felt like other kids that didn't look like me were engaged when I was in the AP classroom this year and it was AP US history and our teacher did a great job of really highlighting, even though we on the West Coast, we have a smaller time to really get everything in with our like AP exams and stuff like that and everything's kind of rushed. She didn't rush, you know, Black history and she really did have other kids engaged with our history and she got into the ugly stuff that, you know, I feel like the school system has been ignoring. She got into the ugly stuff, you know, the lynchings and got really in depth with lynchings. And it wasn't just, oh, black people got killed. They got treated really badly. Like the stuff that they usually just say, but they don't go into depth. She got into the names of the people, where they happened, why they happened. We had projects on these people. We were, you know, stuff like that. And it's sad that we, if you only have to be in an AP class to learn about these stuff. And I compared what I was learning to my to students that like to my friends that weren't in this class and I noticed that they're what they were talking about with black history wasn't what I was talking about and it's not fair because everybody should get into depth the way we got into depth about it and it's like it's like when you're in a regular classroom and it's like a history classroom they kind of just like what Daniel was saying they it's repeated it's the same thing I've been learning since elementary school you know mm-hmm. Martin Luther King you know civil rights you know, slavery happened, it's always the same thing. We don't ever get into depth. We don't hit Malcolm X. We just, you know, they act like our history started with slavery when it didn't. You know, there's other, you know, we're more than just slavery, civil rights. There's more about Black people in America to learn about than just the ugly stuff. We never hit on the positive stuff. It's almost like we've never had a positive history, which isn't true. And it's sad that we don't talk about the good stuff that happened within our community and I'm glad that we hit on the nasty stuff, but, you know, if we could highlight in our school system that, you know, the accomplishments, just so for, like, it's just this, to show my peers that, you know, my history isn't just nasty and sad on my part. You know, when we talk about stuff like the Holocaust, it's like everybody's respectful, but when we talk about stuff like slavery, it's just like, it's okay to not be engaged, you know, because of the stuff that you've been learning since elementary school, and it's sad that it has to be that way. Absolutely. That's so true. Thank you for sharing that thought. Um, So I just want to point out our time. Um, This hour has sped by. So I'm going to pose our last question to our students on today's call. Um, And it comes from a quote pulled from the ODE 2020-21 guidelines. So I'll read this quote and then ask a question. So for the 2020-21 to 21 school year, ODE has recommended an investment in differentiated learning opportunities and supports for staff across various identities and roles that focus on building relationships, social emotional wellness, and navigating differences across culture, power, and privilege. How would students like to see this effort actualized? And that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of a big chunk there. So we can break that down a little bit. Um, So one of the main ideas is uh, this hope to basically bring support to staff across various identity roles um, and really wanting to focus on building relationships. Um, And so the question is, how would you as a student like to see this effort come into reality? Um, we've been talking a little bit about this already today, I think, just talking about actually building relationships um, and not reverting quickly to um, just kicking a student out of the classroom or um, the, the typical ways that discipline has been rolling out. Um, so how would we like to see uh, this effort actually actualized? For me, I would like to see how <clears throat> how it's not just a black people problem. It's just like everyone contributes it. So I like to see acknowledgement on that part, how everyone is involved, everyone contributes it, everyone can have an impact on racism, on oppression, on privilege, and everyone can benefit from it in a positive and negative way. And so I would like to see more education on that side and how each individual person contributes it and can make a difference for the positive practice side and change. And 
why they should change and to move forward on. So I would just like to see the growth in that with uh, not only students and teachers, but also with their family and what they're, what they're bringing home to their parents, their siblings, their aunts, their uncles, what they're bringing home with them and how they carry themselves. Mm. Yes, yes. I love what you just said there. Yeah. Like snaps to that. When, when I see uh, in the different schools that I've been in, when I see trainings happening, sometimes I see that restorative practices or trainings or equity and equity teams Sometimes I see schools where that's only just for the administration tier. Um, some schools I see that's only for the equity staff. Some, um, some schools I see is only for a select group of teachers to actually practice and get involved in. But like you said, um, the, that, that, that system of oppression, of needing to break down these issues, these barriers, and that training, those conversations, is like from everyone, it comes from everyone, and it goes to everyone. And so it's, it's a community response. You know, community partners um, should be a part of those conversations as well. Uh, very, very great point. Mm -hmm. Would any other students like to speak to this uh, same question? Yeah, I do. If you're feeling that way, you're, you and your family should find ways to help other people when the black people and if um, you are feeling like if you see a person on the road um, needing help, you should help them because it's not fair for the homeless people to that um, to um it's not fair for any of the homeless people to like be have trash thrown at them, ha have like be making fun of them, hurting them. It's not. It's not right. Uh, some someone should like at least give them something instead of being rude, throwing stuff at them, and laughing at them. So it's making the other person feel bad. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'd just like to say that this, this is not the end of the conversation. Even as we bring the event to a close, these conversations will be ongoing. Uh, there will be many meetings after this to take what uh, our, our students are saying, what you guys are saying, to synthesize that and to bring that uh, solutions out of that. Um, I, I know uh, there will be so many conversations that come out of it. Um, and definitely look to, to see what comes next. Um, what are the, 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 the next steps? Um, I would like to open up the floor to director of ODE um, and uh, Colt Gill to be able to uh, close without with any remarks, any things that you might have heard um, as well, uh, potentially even uh, Jim Green, uh, if you'd like to kind of respond on any of some of the things that you've heard. No. Can I hang up? Oh, so, uh, this is Jim Green. I'm the executive director of the Oregon School Boards Association. I just want to really thank the kids, the students for their voice. I was here to listen, learn, and lean in to get this work going and, and get it started because um, we're way overdue for the work that needs to be done that these kids have talked about over the last two days. Their stories are uh, tragic and at the same time, a call to action for all of us. So I wanna make sure the students understand, at least from the OSBA and a school board's perspective, we and our members are gonna do everything we can to assure that programs, services, teachers, everything that they need as supports are there to make them successful students. And we wanna work as partners with REAP and the other members that are on the phone call to assure that happens for our students. It's too important, it's too late, and we need to do the work. Thank you, thank you. Cole Gill? Yeah, thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, to be welcomed into this space. Uh, uh, and I just wanna say the students, um, you are so <laughs> um, right on and eloquent and um, brilliant and thinking really deeply about all of these things. And I, I really appreciate the time with you. We've had members of our leadership team 
with you yesterday listening and today. Um, they came back to a meeting this morning and shared with the rest of our leadership team um, your voices and, and what they heard and are looking at how we can take next steps to um, stay connected with you all, especially as we move forward in this time um, with what's happening in our world in, in many ways. Um, there, there is uh, so many opportunities to have more student voice with our State Board of Education, with our African-American Black Student Success Advisory Group. There, there are um, ways that we can get your voices into the room and that's what I'm hoping we can do. This was really powerful for our team. So thank you for being willing to let us listen in. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being a part of the conversation. Um, I wanna point you guys over to the chat. Uh, there will be some links that are gonna be dropped in in terms of upcoming events for our Institute of Purpose, uh, looking to get students continue to learn uh, throughout the summer as well. At five o'clock PM tonight, there's gonna be an HBCU event that will also be dropped into the chat. If Mr. Jackson, if you'd like to end out on any other words as the uh, links are dropped into the chat. Well, I wanna give space to Craig Hawkins, who's the executive director for, uh, for COSA, who wanted to have any closing remarks. Craig? Oh, well, thank you, Mark. And I wanna to apologize to everybody. I had to step away for a few minutes. I had uh, a phone call that I absolutely had to take from, from one of our members who's, uh, needed some support, but I, but I just wanted to appreciate you, Mark, and, and your entire team at REAP. Um, and, uh, you know, the information that we've gathered, the recommendations and thoughts, um, the experiences that, you know, we've heard over the last few days are gonna be really important for us. As you know, we've got um, multiple groups of leaders of color and COSA members in general working. Uh, student voice is really important to us as we try to move forward and, and, and work together to, to really truly move forward, um, all of us. And, and so we'll be connecting with you, you with, with REAP and, and with students to help us um, just figure out what are those next steps we can, we can take together to really make some progress. Thanks so much, Craig, and thanks, Jim, and Colt, and uh, Reef students. You all were amazing. Uh, on behalf of our CEO and founder, Lavelle Thomas, and our board and staff, we just want to celebrate you all's courage over these past two days to be transparent and share your stories. It's never easy, uh, but you uh, are, are certainly uh, voices of leadership and uh, a hope for our future. So thank you for your time today over these past two days. I want to encourage you all to follow REAP on our social media platforms. Uh, visit us on our website, reapusa.org. And we appreciate both COSA, HEC, ODE, and also SBA for being a partner with REAP on this town hall, along with Bridge and uh, Africa House. And look forward to ongoing collaboration. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Have a good evening.